If you would uh, turn over to the book of Nahum. Sort of started there uh, last week. Before we uh, proceed, though, let's have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this study, for the for these lives that uh, were lived so long ago in Thy service, and for the word that was left to us, that instructs us in the ways of salvation, that we may better know Thy will for us, Thy love for us, and Thy righteousness, and Thy justice. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> One thing we should always uh, keep in mind that these prophets were actually real people. And they were lived in uh, real times. You know, we say this is 2021. I don't know how they counted time back there, but they were counting time just like we do, years and so forth. So they uh, they were real people. They lived in a political uh, environment just like we do today. I don't think that, well, I don't know, but uh, we've, we've had some pretty cruel uh, despots over the last century or so, but they were no more cruel than what they were back in the time that these prophets were writing. And uh, Nahum is uh, really dealing with Nineveh. You know, I've said before that God will punish the wicked, but he always uh, provides a way for people to avoid that punishment. In Nahum, you will not see that. It is strictly a book of condemnation. However, it's a con condemnation of uh, Nineveh, the uh, capital of Assyria, stands for Assyria, same deal. But you do recall that Jonah, uh, reluctantly, but he did make an uh, and appeal to Nineveh to repent, and they did. So they had the opportunity to re repent also, and they did, but they uh, slid back into their old idolatrous and, and heathen ways. So, uh, as I said before, God always is always looking for repentance, but he will eventually render judgment. Not because he uh, likes just likes to, you know, punish people. He he doesn't like to do that. But because of his nature, he must deal with unrighteousness. Must deal with it. The uh, kings of uh, Nineveh that we'll start with anyway is uh, it's, it's mentioned a number of times. Tiglath Pileser the third. He was the first one we uh, would deal with, or that we know of. They, they were before Assyria became a, if you want to call it a war, a world power. There were some other kings before that time, but they were really just uh, regional kings. They weren't really a, if you want to call it a world power. Uh, they weren't that at the time. But Tiglath Pileser the third began to expand the. Uh, uh, conquest of uh, Syria and to do that of course they had to invade other countries and he did and following Tiglath Pileser Tiglath Pileser the third was, was Shalmaneser the, the fifth and he began the siege of Samaria but he died before the uh, city fell. Then there came Sargon the second, and it's interesting about Sargon the second. Second, he he uh, completed the uh, siege of Samaria, and, and um, of course a lot of these kings back that time he was murdered. <laughs> you know, 
He must have been a Republican. He's murdered. <laughs> Democrats got him. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when Nancy and I and Keith, you know, when we went to France, we went to the uh, Louvre Museum, which is, uh, best I recall, the largest museum in the world. And they had a lot of artifacts of Sargon II in that museum. Now, the Louvre is principally a art museum, not uh, an artifact museum. But the British Museum is primarily an artifact museum and not an art museum. And of course, David, and, you know, we've been the British Museum, and they have a lot of artifacts from Assyria, from uh, some of these, a lot of these kings here, and some that existed uh, or ruled prior to. Tiglath the Pleaser the Third. So these were real characters. You know, we have evidence of their existence, and we can view now the things that they viewed back in their time. You know, almost 3,000 years ago. Not quite 3,000, but almost 3,000 years ago. But after Sargon II, uh, there was Sennacherib. Uh, they we have artifacts, I say we have, there exist artifacts where he is uh, boasted that he had uh, shut up Hezekiah in Jerusalem. There are actually artifacts that say that. And uh, given the politics of the time, he was murdered by his two sons. I've got two sons, don't I? Yeah, well, anyway, never mind. <laughs> Uh, they were driven out, uh, these two sons were driven out by another son, uh, Chardon. He became uh, king, and he just ruled for about, I don't know, 12, 13 years, something like that. And then Ashurbanipal uh, became king, and his campaign in Egypt resulted in the fall of no Ammon, we'll read about that as we go through this book. And a lot of booty was taken. I mean, you know, this, that's one of the ways the, the soldiers got paid was to uh, capture all this booty. And of course, the king got most of it, I'm sure. And he was supposed to be a very cruel king, but most of these kings were very cruel. Then after him, Asher Edel Ilani ruled. He only ruled a very short while. Then Sin Shari Ishkin, or Ashardin the uh, second. He was at Nineveh when it was being besieged by the Medes and, and Chaldeans. And so the story goes, and I suppose it's true, he uh, gathered his family his wives and children, and whatever wealth he could gather, he, he gathered it into this palace, set fire to it, and was uh, he, and he and his family, family were burned up in that fire. I assume that be true. Uh, anyway, the native uh, forces of Assyria, because of all these conflicts and wars and what have you, and the fact that they were not a homogeneous population, they were many different uh, ethnic groups, and that caused conflict within the kingdom. But all these wars and political events and what have you kind of exhausted the, uh, the nation, and it weakened them. And as a result, they were eventually uh, defeated by the um, Babylon, Medo-Persian Empire. And as I say, the nation's empires at this time were particularly cruel. I mean, we think about maybe the cruelty of the Nazis toward the Jews and what have you, and which, which was, was very cruel. But they had nothing on the Assyrians or the uh, empires during this time. It was just, life was very cheap. It was very cheap. But anyway, 
all these um, excessive acts of cruelty demanded a judgment. And that's what the book of uh, Nahum is, is the judgment that's uh, going to be visited upon the nation of Assyria, or Nineveh, you don't call it Nineveh, that's the capital. <clears throat> and it talks about the burden against uh, Nineveh in verse 1. Burden is something that Nineveh is going to have to bear. It's their burden, their uh, judgment. The book <clears throat> of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite, we don't really know where this is, and don't know too much about Nahum. Um, you know, of course, Capernaum, Capernaum means village of Nahum, but it's not likely that this is referring to this Nahum. But he had a vision. It's not a dream, it's a vision. And the difference between a dream and a vision, you know, some what God would reveal is uh, uh, things to his prophets, sometimes in dreams, they'd be asleep and they'd actually dream these things. And but a vision, they're not asleep. You know, could be in a trance, could be just, <clears throat> you know, being able to see things on on the wall, what what have you. But it's a, it's not a dream. It's an actual vision. It says here, God is jealous. God will not countenance any competition for His affection. If uh, you render allegiance to God, you can have allegiance to no other. So God is jealous. And uh, if you look at the Hebrew, uh, you know, the word for Lord, it appears in different places, but the Lord is Jehovah. Uh, you know, it's a word that's not actually stated in Hebrew because it was too holy a word to say, so it was uh, used the word Yahweh, and we, we say Jehovah. So there's five, uh, we'll see a series of five Jehovahs, or uh, New King James as Lord. It said, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. And he says it again, the Lord avenges and is furious. He's fierce against those who uh, are disobedient to his will, who uh, practice unrighteousness, who engage in idolatry, cruelty. He's fierce at those kinds of people. And the Lord, Jehovah, will take vengeance on his adversaries. Those who oppose God will eventually have to suffer the vengeance, the, uh, the wrath of God. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. Enemies are those who just uh, won't obey his will. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Uh, this gives us a uh, insight into his nature. He bears with people a long, long time. But eventually, he's going to render judgment. And he has the power to do it. And he will not, here in verse 3, he will not at all acquit the wicked. Judgment must be rendered. He will not overlook wickedness. The Lord has his way. And if you think of a, about a whirlwind and a storm, dust storms, and you, you can't stop it. So he has, he's going to have his way. And whatever uh, the, uh, you know, there was a time for repentance in the time of Jonah. That did happen. And they, again, engaged in unrighteousness. So there's going to be a time uh, of judgment. And you cannot prevent the Lord from rendering judgment. He's going to have his way in the world we're in in the storm. Clouds are the dust of his feet. And talking about his power, he rebukes the sea 
and makes it dry. He dries up the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. Uh, those are different areas. Uh, Carmel by the sea. This place in California by, by that name. But anyway, Carmel by the sea. Uh, these things are going to, to wither. And the flower of Lebanon wilts. Lebanon was a very uh, lush place at that time. But it's going to wilt. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and again, mountains uh, are a symbol of great strength and uh, longevity, and because they've been here since the beginning, they're very powerful, but they're going to quake, they're going to quake before the Lord. He has that much power. The hills melt, the earth heaves at his presence, maybe talking about earthquakes, you know, again, it's because of his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. His power cannot be resisted. And who can stand before his indignation? He's really talking about uh, Syria. Who can stand before his in in indignation? Syria is going to be helpless. At this time, they were the most uh, powerful nation in the world at that time that the, anybody knew about. But they're going to be helpless. And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Again, it's a, an image of the great power that he possesses and the things that he's going to uh, accomplish in rendering his judgment against the uh, Assyrian nation. But he has another side. It's not all just uh, condemnation and judgment and wrath and what have you. He's got a, God has, an, has a, another side. The Lord is good. A stronghold in, in the day of trouble. You know, if uh, this is, ought to be assurance to those that are faithful to the Lord that whatever uh, the situation may be, stronghold, you can have, uh, you have faith in, the, in God Almighty that can be a stronghold to you, a security that cannot, no one can take that away from you. And he knows those who trust in him. But with a overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place. He's talking about Nineveh. He's going to make a utter end of Nineveh. And darkness will pursue his enemies, those of the Ninevites. Wherever they go, they're not going to find light. It's going to be uh, bleakness and darkness and complete uh, destruction. And talking about the destruction of uh, Nineveh and the deliverance of Judas, verse 9, he says, What do you conspire, conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. It doesn't matter what the uh, Ninevites do. He's going to make an end of them. And affliction will not rise up a second time. And it may be talking about the, uh, the faithful of uh, uh, Judah at this time, that they, their affliction from, of course, they had been afflicted by the, the uh, Syrians at one time, and they were delivered. But they were never going to be afflicted by the, the Assyrians again. Verse 10, for a while... Tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards. And again, talk about the uh, Ninevites that are trying to escape. They're going to get uh, all tangled up in the, the bramble briars, briars, you know. And uh, they're going to be like drunken men. They can't stand up. They're going to stumble wherever they go trying to get away. They shall be devoured like stubble fully dried. And, buddy, you may remember this back in the, uh, when there were still farms around here that in the, I guess, the fall or spring or whatever, they would, you know, they, they would cut the crops, you know, hay or whatever. Then they would burn the fields. Do you remember that? They burned pretty good. And, of course, the reason they did that was for weed and, and pest control. But, but uh, this same situation, there's going to be stubble there. They're going to burn it. And uh, talking about the Ninevites, they, 
they're, they're just going to be burned up. From you comes forth one uh, who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. And it may be the king of uh, Assyria they're talking about, and but he's not going to prevail either. Thus says the Lord in verse 12, Though they are safe, and likewise many, yet in this manner they will cut down. And they may be, maybe a lot of them, and they may feel safe in their city, but they're going to be cut down. And when he passes through you, if you go back up to verse 11, it's talking about uh, from you comes forth one, maybe the same one that passes through you. Though I have afflicted you, of course the, uh, the Jews were going to suffer some because of the, the uh, Babylonians that they're going to destroy Assyria. But they're not going to be afflicted anymore by the Assyrians. Just, that's not going to happen. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds uh, apart. He's, he's talking about break the bonds of Assyria, not Babylon, because they, they're not going to escape the uh, uh, bonds of Babylon. That's, that will come later. The Lord has given a command concerning you. <clears throat> your name will shall be perpetrated no longer out of the house of your gods. Let me get over. I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave for you are vile. Nineveh is going to have to deal with God. They are no longer going to be in control. Uh, their idols and what have you will avail them nothing. They're going to have to deal with God, and God is going to have his vengeance upon them. In verse 15, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. You know, we, we talked about that before. There's going to be one that's going to pass through him. He is utterly cut off. Assyria is not going to be a problem anymore to Judah. And they'll be able to keep their feast and what have you. But, of course, uh, you know, there's a day of reckoning coming for Judah, too. In chapter 2, he who scatters has come up before your face man the fort watch the road strengthen your flanks fortify your power mightily now it'd be a, if it's at all possible you might just uh, in your mind's eye kind of think of uh, a battle that's going to take place it's very descriptive here as to uh, what's going to happen to Nineveh. He said, man, the fort, you know, it, he's telling the Ninevites, you know, you better get prepared. Make preparation. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the empty years have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. Again, talking about uh, Nineveh. They're going to be emptied out. The shields of his mighty men are made red. He's probably talking about the Chaldeans at this point in time. Their shields are going to be made red. And that doesn't necessarily mean red with blood. It may be just the uh, color of the shields themselves. It may be copper, or, uh, copper uh, covered or something like that. And when you're looking at it in the sun, it may be kind of reddish. And the valiant men are in scarlet. That may be the dress of the, the soldiers. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle uh, one another in the broad roads. 
They seem like torches, they run like lightning. So this is an image of the invading armies of the Chaldeans. Now it's interesting to note that uh, the uh, weapons of war that the Chaldeans used probably were invented by the Assyrians. The, the Assyrians are very innovative in their uh, development of weapons of war, like the chariot, for example. And chariot was a, the uh, Abrams tank of the time. It, it was something to be, to be feared. And the chariots are, once they come into Nineveh, they're going to you know, occupy all the streets and what have you. It's going to be just overrun. In verse 5, he, that's the uh, king of Nineveh, remembers his worthies, you know, his mighty men, whoever they may be. They stumbled in their walk. They're trying to get away, so they're stumbling when they're trying to get away. They make haste to her walls, trying to get out, and the defense is prepared. The gates of the river are opened, and the palace is dissolved. That doesn't mean that the, uh, you know, the river itself uh, flooded the walls and the walls like, you know, uh, sand on the beach kind of washed away. It doesn't mean that the uh, walls literally uh, melted or dissolved, or the palace dissolved. But uh, metaphorically, they did. They were as if they dissolved because the uh, Chaldeans overran the palace. It is decreed she shall be led away captive, and then it was. She shall be brought up, and her maidservants shall lead her as with the voice of doves beating their breast. You know, um, how doves coo and what have you. They're going to be uh, uh, lamenting their fate cooing like doves and breeding their breast out of uh, sorrow. In verse 8, though, Nineveh O was like a pool of water. Now, again, you have to remember in, in these countries, water was very important. It is now. Water is very important. A lot of countries don't have good drinking water, so water is very important. So if there's a pool of water, pe people gather around that uh, pool of water. Now, when this all happens, they flee away. All taught, they cry, whoever it is that's crying that, the leaders, I suppose. But no one turns them back. They're trying to get away. And now Nahum speaks to the invaders, the Chaldeans. And this is a, uh, an assonance. Now, you probably don't run across that word very often. <laughs> but an assonance is, uh, let's see, in uh, English we can say uh, Peter Piper picked a peck of pip pickled peppers. That's an assonance. Now, you try to con translate that into Hebrew and you see what it sounds like. It's no longer an assonance. But in the Hebrew, if you were to go uh, down here, uh, well, in verse 10, empty, desolate, and waste, if you go to the Hebrew, who speaks Hebrew, Hebrew here? Anyway, if you go to Hebrew, they sound alike. Not exactly, but they, they kind of sound alike. So that, that's an essence. Takes ball of silver, takes ball of gold. There's no end of treasure. Just fill it up. Fill up the wagons and haul it all back. Our wealth of every desirable prize. She's empty, speaking of Nineveh, desolate and a waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side and all their faces are drained of color. Just imagine battle and the fear that uh, one has during battle. So we'll take up in verse 11 uh, next week. I appreciate your presence. Thank you.